On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including an Apple co-founder's mission to clean up space junk, more debate over the cost of NASA's Artemis moon missions, SpaceX diverting resources to aiding Ukraine and Rocket Lab finding a home for their upcoming Neuron project. So let's get going. This is The Space Race. Privateer is a new space company co-founded by Steve Wozniak, who you probably know as the guy who launched Apple computers with Steve Jobs out of their garage in the mid-70s. Now Woz is in the business of managing space junk. Announced last September, Privateer's mission is to help humanity treat the space environment as if our lives depend on it. And its first step is an app named Wayfinder that gives users a real-time visualization of current space assets and debris. Wayfinder is a 3D globe that allows satellite operators and even the casual observer to peel back the layers of satellite constellations, orbits, and countries to get a better picture of what is going on up there. Basically, you can see every satellite in orbit all at once. You can check it out on the company's website, the app is really fun to play around with, and it's pretty crazy to see a visualization of all the satellites and discarded rocket parts that are above our heads. You can filter by country of origin or even by constellation. So if you just want to see all Starlink satellites, you can do that. You can also scrub both forwards and backwards in time to track the positions of satellites, which is really fun to watch in the app. Co-founder of Privateer Steve Wozniak said at Wayfinder's release, we are at a clear inflection point and facing exponential growth of space commercialization. At Privateer, we see this turning point as a real opportunity to lead and educate people about space sustainability and for space operators, help ensure their safety and sustainability. Having a better global understanding of what's already up in space is critical to powering the new space economy. The way the business model works is Privateer will provide a basic level of information for free and then charge for more advanced forecasts and custom tracking solutions. CEO and co-founder of Privateer, Alex Fielding, said, We will give away 24 hours ahead and will sell when you need to see further ahead. We think it's fair to give away 24 hours ahead and charge for something more bespoke and more advanced. Wayfinder can see as far as 72 hours ahead for low Earth orbit and 7 days for geostationary orbit. Privateer is also working on space-based systems to track objects. The company is completing work on a three-unit CubeSat called Pano-1, scheduled to launch later this year, that will carry 42 sensors. Privateer is interested in flying future systems as hosted payloads on other satellites rather than building its own constellation. So they'll be attaching their sensors onto satellites that were already going to launch anyway, because it would be kind of weird if the anti-space junk company were just adding to the problem themselves. By taking their system into space, it could enable more accurate and persistent tracking of objects in low Earth orbit. Okay, something weird is going on with the Artemis program over at NASA. This is, of course, the three-mission plan that will eventually return people to the surface of the moon, and that's supposed to happen sometime in this decade, as early as 2025. Or is it? Money has come up as the latest point of contest in the ongoing saga of Artemis, and we're getting some real mixed messaging right now. So, on Tuesday, March 1st, NASA Inspector General Paul Martin appeared before a House Science Committee hearing on NASA's Artemis program. During that talk, Martin revealed his calculations for the operational cost of the SLS rocket and spacecraft for the first time, which are astronomical. Martin said that the operational costs alone for a single Artemis launch for just the rocket, Orion spacecraft, and ground systems will total $4.1 billion. This is, he said, a price tag that strikes us as unsustainable. Martin even took shots at NASA and its large aerospace contractors for what he called their very poor performance in developing these vehicles. Martin especially threw down his gauntlet and said NASA cannot have a meaningful exploration program based around SLS and Orion at this cost. Of course, the SLS is their gigantic rocket booster that is cobbled together from old recycled space shuttle parts, and Orion is the crew vehicle that will fly to the moon 
but cannot land there. Later in the hearing, Martin broke down the costs per flight, which apply to at least the first four launches of the Artemis program. $2.2 billion to build a single SLS rocket, $568 million for ground systems, $1 billion for an Orion spacecraft, and $300 million to the European Space Agency for Orion's service module. Martin claims NASA had checked and confirmed these figures. However, on March 4th, we got a response from NASA's Space Launch System Manager, John Honeycutt, and he was having none of it. Honeycutt told an SLS media briefing at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, I will certainly say that the SLS rocket is not going to come at a cost of $4 billion a shot. I think his take is that the Inspector General is factoring in development costs and rolling those into each rocket launch, which he doesn't think is fair to say. According to Honeycutt, SLS has been appropriated to the tune of about $20 billion since 2012 for its life from 2012 to 2021. We used about $11 billion of that for the development and the production and the assembly for Artemis 1, and the balance of that has gone toward what I alluded to earlier relative to getting those other five rockets in flow for later missions as well as putting together infrastructure to do all this development and testing that we needed to go do. Honeycutt then said, This is a generational rocket, and we all know development is costly early on. So, I think he's making a fair point on some things, and is out to lunch on some others. NASA is right to say that you can't just take the total cost of the program, divide it evenly across four launches, and say that's how much each launch will cost. Because, of course, the time and money that goes into the research and development for launch number one is not going to be the same for launch number four, because it only needs to be done once. Startup costs. So, in that regard, the Inspector General was being a bit sensational. On the other hand, Honeycutt lost me when he called SLS a generational rocket. It's not. If SLS wasn't irreversibly linked to the next moon landing, which I really want to happen, then I'd say it should be fired directly into the sun as soon as possible, and then never spoken of again. SLS might be more powerful than Falcon Heavy, but the Falcon makes it look like a dinosaur from a technology standpoint. SLS and Orion are fully disposable, which is very obviously something that the aerospace industry is moving away from, for good reason. Starship is going to make SLS look absolutely stupid by comparison. It can lift more weight and is fully reusable. If Blue Origin ever made New Glenn, it would also humiliate the SLS. Even Little Rocket Lab are miles ahead with their neutron concept. That rocket is like alien sci-fi technology compared to SLS. So, for NASA to say that all of this money they're spending is an investment in the future, it's not. Elon Musk said on March 5th that SpaceX will be reprioritized to cyber defense and overcoming signal jamming, at the expense of slight delays in Starship and Starlink V2. In a series of late-night tweets, Musk said that the company was shifting its resources in response to jamming of Starlink terminals in Ukraine. A recent update to Starlink software bypasses the jamming, he added, but did not elaborate. This all comes after the Ukrainian vice prime minister personally reached out to Elon Musk, asking for Starlink stations to help his people stay connected under brutal attack from the Russian army. Within two days, Elon had somehow gotten a truck full of the terminals into the conflict zone. We still do not know how that happened. The US government has denied helping SpaceX, but I hope to hear that story someday. As the Russian forces target more and more communications and broadcast infrastructure, satellite internet might be the only functioning connection between people in Ukraine and with the outside world. And Elon has continued to work on making Starlink more effective for the Ukrainian people. Musk tweeted March 3rd that SpaceX made other software changes to reduce the terminal's power consumption, allowing it to be powered by a cigarette lighter in a car and to enable roaming on moving vehicles. Musk also claimed that Starlink is the only non-Russian communication system still working in some parts of Ukraine, so the probability of being targeted is high. Please use with caution. He then went on to explain that the dishes should be kept as far away from people as possible and that they could be covered over with light camouflage or even painted as long as there was no metal traces in the paint. So, the richest man in the world basically switched over to live tech support for Ukraine's resistance fighters, which I have to say is pretty cool. 
The last update that we've seen from Elon on the matter is his response to calls that Starlink should block Russian news sources from their network. He says that Ukraine has not made that request, but some governments have. In another tweet, Musk said that Starlink would not block Russian news sources from its network unless at gunpoint, adding that he was sorry to be a free speech absolutist. In another update on our favorite up-and-coming aerospace company, Rocket Lab announced that it will build, launch, and land its Neutron rocket in Virginia near NASA's Wallops Flight Facility and the company's US-based launch complex. Rocket Lab will expand its presence in Virginia with a 250,000 square foot facility in Accomack County. The new facility will include a launch control center, neutron production, vertical assembly, and payload integration. Construction of the site is expected to begin very shortly. Rocket Lab received $69 million from the Commonwealth of Virginia, General Assembly's Major Employment and Investment Project Approval Commission, and the U.S. Space Force to build the facility. In total, Rocket Lab expects Neutron's facility to bring 250 jobs to the area. No new word on when we might see Neutron start flying. Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck has said that he doesn't want to give timelines in case they slip, which is pretty standard for launch vehicle development. In a statement, Beck said, quote, Neutron is a new generation of rocket that will advance the way space is assessed, and Virginia makes perfect sense as a significant site for Neutron's early development. I'm thankful for the Commonwealth's enthusiasm and backing of Neutron, which combined with the state's rich heritage as an aerospace state, made it difficult to see anywhere else but Virginia to begin Neutron's journey. End quote. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.